Hi, my name is Mary Vukicevich and this presentation is about ocular trauma. The topics that will be covered here include eyelid trauma, trauma to the orbit, corneal foreign bodies, chemical burns and orbital fractures. Let's start by having a look at trauma to the eyelids. When a patient presents with an eyelid laceration, it's really important to take an accurate history, which eye is affected, how it happened, when it happened, what kind of symptoms the patient is experiencing. In terms of the signs, you need to make your own observations of what you are seeing. And some further investigations might be required for the patient. For example, uh, an exploration of the wound. And the top image is showing the exploration of uh, an extensive laceration, which has actually been caused by a dog bite. Um, and so uh, the patient may then need to be sent off for an orbital X-ray or a CT, depending on uh, the signs and symptoms. The lower picture shows a torn lower eyelid and that's where the dog has bitten the patient on the face. And there's, an, there's the lower canaliculus which is actually out of, out of uh, position there. And so the clinical question is what secondary problems could an injury like this cause? So I want you to have a think about if the lower canaliculus is not in position and the eyelid is affected in the way that's shown in the lower image, what sort of problems is this patient going to have? Here's another example of a lid laceration and this one was um, is classified as an occult orbitocranial penetrating injury and there's the laceration there. Now the reason that it's called an occult injury and a cult is actually referring to something that's hidden. And in this case, what's happened is a pencil has entered this patient's eye and has penetrated and it's hiding up behind the lid. If we have a look at the x-rays, here, here are the orbits. The nose is there, the brain up here, and there's the pencil. It's lodged in behind the eyelid. There's another picture of the pencil here. And so here we've got the orbit, the extraocular muscles, and here are the sinuses and the nose. And so you can see the pencil is way up and lodged right up inside the eye. Here's another picture of it there. So again, the same uh, thing is that you need to take a thorough history of what's happened and note the signs and symptoms that the patient is experiencing. And then they may need to go for further testing. In this case, uh, absolutely had to, to determine where um, and what was going on with this particular injury. Other kind of eyelid injuries that you could see um, include periocular hematomas. And a periocular hematoma is basically a black eye and it's a, a collection of blood in a certain area or um, bruising in a certain area around the eyeballs. And this type of Oedema is the most common blunt injury to the eyelid or forehead and generally it looks a lot worse than it is and it's usually not um, dangerous. It can however become an issue if there is a fracture of the orbital floor or the orbital roof or if there's a basal skull fracture and so the patient probably will need to be referred for a CT or X-ray to determine that there's no fractures behind all that bruising. When you see this sort of panda eye appearance with this redness all around both eyes, this is suggestive of a basal skull fracture and that can be quite dangerous. So um, again, when you see these type of lacerations or bruises and what have you around the eyelids, careful history is the most important, careful history taking and finding out what, where, how, why the injury happened so that the next step can progress normally. We're going to move on now to orbital trauma. And orbital trauma can um, be either blunt or penetrating. And I'll, I'll explain the difference of both of those to you. So let's start by looking at blunt orbital trauma. 
um, and we'll have a look at the image here on the left. Now, this shows what's called a high femur. That's spelt H-Y-P-H-A-E-M-A, a high femur. And it's a very common complication of a blunt ocular injury. And what happens is that the source of the bleeding is usually at the iris root or at the ciliary body. And so, so what happens is those structures bleed and you get this pooling of blood with a fluid level appearance in the anterior chamber. The image on the right hand side is a picture of optic nerve avulsion and this is rare but it occurs when an object intrudes between the globe and the orbital wall and displaces the eye so the eye moves around. It's thought that the mechanism for this is um, a sudden extreme rotation or anterior displacement of the globe. And this avulsion where the, where the uh, optic nerve moves out of place can, can be isolated or it can occur in association with other orbital injuries. And so when you look in at the fundus, you'll see this striking cavity where the optic nerve head has actually retracted from the dural sheath. It's just moved away and there's a hole in there. So it's, see it's kind of flipped upwards. Here's the intact part of the optic nerve and it's flipped up, avulsed, as they call it, and then it's let you, the patient is left with a cavity. Of course, this is going to have a severe impact on visual acuity. Here are some common causes of blunt orbital trauma, and they include fists, so someone punching somebody else, rocks being thrown, squash balls or rackets hitting the eye, champagne corks is another common uh, cause of orbital trauma, and the simple prevention is to wear eye protection, particularly when playing ball sports um, or when opening a, a, a bottle of champagne. But just be wary that that cork can fly and hit you right in the eye. So what happens is blunt trauma to the eye may actually result in considerable damage to the intraocular contents. And a fracture of the orbital wall can occur due to the transfer of mechanical energy to what is a very thin orbital bone. Uh, and here's the mechanism shown here. So something strikes the eye and then the force moves backwards and affects the whole globe. If the trauma is of sufficient force, it may result in globe rupture. And this is typically where the scleral wall is the thinnest at the limbus. Um, or behind the insertion of the rectus muscles. So the kind of thing that you'll see in terms of signs in a patient that's had blunt orbital trauma includes a black eye with lid bruising, and we call this ecchymosis, and you can see that down here in this image below. Atosis, and this patient has atosis, a droopy eyelid. Subconjunctival hemorrhage, they also have that, the, the conjunctiva has bled there. Corneal abrasions can um, be common as well, a high femur, which is shown here. Um, there can be iris problems, uh, for example, traumatic medriasis, so the pupils are dilated as a result of the trauma. There can be lens subluxation, where the lens actually um, moves out of place, a cataract can appear, the patient can develop a vitreous hemorrhage, and they can develop something called a commotio retinae. Uh, a commotio is a bruised retina. Um, they can also develop a retinal tear or a retinal detachment. So if you have blunt orbital trauma causing anterior eye damage, what happens is there's a compressive force which causes tearing, tearing into the anterior chamber. And most of the time, most high femurs result from tears at the anterior face of the ciliary body and they disrupt the arterial supply. And so the high femur develops in the anterior chamber. Here's a picture of the high femur there in black. The high femur can also result in um, ruptured iris vessels, cyclodialysis or iridodialysis. 
cyclodialysis or iridodialysis is when the um, structures tear away from one another and that causes the bleeding to occur. Here are some more images of anterior blunt orbital trauma. Um, lens subluxation is shown here. So what you can see is a dilated pupil, there's the iris, and here is the lens and you can see it's fallen down, it's out of position and you can kind of see the zonules here. Um, and so what what should it what it should look like is you you shouldn't be able to see this edge rim of the lens it should be right up here um, so it's it's fallen down into the into the chamber um, this is showing a star shaped or a stellate cataract which can occur as a result of uh, blunt trauma and the image on the top, on the bottom there is showing iridodialysis and this is where there's separation or tearing away of the iris from its attachment to the ciliary body and here it's caused a distortion to the pupil shape. The images here show posterior damage caused by blunt orbital trauma and the image on the left is of a commotio retina and this is basically a concussion of the sensory retina and it um, results in this cloudy swelling of the retina that gives it a grey um, sort of whitish appearance and it usually affects the temporal fundus and um, that will usually subside and doesn't require treatment. Um, the other thing that can occur is a choroidal rupture and you can see the choroidal rupture here and here in this patient. And what happens is the rupture involves the choroid, the Brux membrane, and the retinal pigment epithelium, which is the brown stuff that you can see. Now, if the choroidal rupture is peripheral, the patient may not even notice it. But in this case, it's right over the macular area, so they are going to have uh, their vision affected. Trauma can also cause a retinal detachment, and uh, retinal detachments are, are covered in a different presentation to this one. Here's another type of posterior orbital trauma that you may see and this is uh, caused by an abusive head trauma or this is also known as shaken baby syndrome and this is a form of physical abuse which occurs typically in children under the age of two years old and of all the babies who have abusive head trauma more than 25% of them will unfortunately die and this type of trauma is responsible for up to 50% of deaths from child abuse. It's caused by violently shaking or hitting the baby in the head. And if these characteristic ophthalmic features that you see here are identified, then the patient needs to be referred to a specialist pediatrician for follow-up and for diagnosis because then it becomes a quite a serious um, matter and possibly a criminal investigation. What happens in, in these cases is the baby presents with irritability, they're lethargic and tired and vomiting. And the problem is that it can be misdiagnosed as something like gastro because uh, the person that's accompanying the child may not reveal the history of the trauma. Signs of head injury can also be present and the the baby might have a skull fracture or soft tissue bruising on their face or head and the ocular features include retinal hemorrhage which are the which is sort of the most common and you can see severe retinal hemorrhage um, all throughout here um, particularly around the macular area so this is going to cause some se se quite serious sight loss the baby can have bruising around the eye or a subconjunctival hemorrhage which is is um, associated with this abusive head trauma. They may have a pupil defect and vision loss may also be due to a cerebral damage, damage to the brain itself and not necessarily um, just from the hemorrhaging here. So this is quite serious and um, these signs need to be observed very very carefully in any child presenting with uh, uh, you know what looks like bruising or, or so on around the eyes. So we've looked at blunt trauma, but let's have a look now at penetrating trauma. 
It's interesting that penetrating injuries are three times more common in males than females, and they typically occur in a younger age group. So 50% of penetrating traumas occur in men aged between 15 to 34 years. And what are the reasons? Well, the most frequent causes are assaults, uh, domestic or occupational accidents, and of course, playing sport. And um, how extensive the penetrating injury is actually depends on what's caused it. And in the case of the eye shown here in the picture, this patient has got a fish hook caught inside the eye. And you can see the hook here, and that's boring into the sclera just next to the iris. So when the patient has a penetrating injury like this of paramount importance is the risk of infection because now the orbit is no longer closed and, and something's gotten in there potentially containing germs and um, the patient can go on to develop quite a, quite a severe infection from this. Some other examples of penetrating um, trauma include this image here which is anterior capsular rupture and this is due to a slingshot um, hitting the eye and the patient um, can develop complications because the iris then gets stuck to the lens and this becomes a problem with the functioning of the iris and the pupil. The, um, the bottom image shows the posterior synechi of the iris um, changing its shape and the, the pupil changing its shape in this particular patient. So think about the problems that this patient might have if their pupil doesn't function the way it's supposed to, particularly in bright light. Let's move on now to corneal foreign bodies. So what sort of stuff uh, are patients likely to present with when they come in with a corneal foreign body? Well, 50, well more than 50% of things come from metals and it, you, the metal foreign bodies are very, very common. So this is from sort of things like grinding or drilling. So usually occupational type um, injuries, but sometimes at home too, depending on what patients are doing at home in terms of house maintenance and so on. 15% of foreign body injuries are from gardening. So patients get branches or sawdust or whippersnippers in their eyes. 13% um, of injuries come from chemicals, and these include paint, chlorine, oven cleaner, battery acid, uh, dishwashing liquid even. So again, as with all these injuries, very, very careful history taking and symptom taking is extremely important. Small foreign bodies like particles of steel or sand will affect the corneal or conjunctival surface. And what happens is they can be washed along the tear film into the lacrimal drainage system or they get stuck to the conjunctiva and cause scratches over the cornea each time the um, patient blinks. So they get a repeated corneal abrasion. And the patient will complain of a significant gritty feeling and um, when a patient presents with a corneal foreign body, you also need to be wary of any intraocular foreign body that may not necessarily be visible. So here is a picture of the corneal foreign body, just there, and there's a high, um, highly magnified image of the same um, of the same foreign body. Chemical burns is the next topic. Chemical injuries range in severity from something that's very trivial to potentially blinding. And the majority of chemical injuries are accidental, but some of them are due to assault. And two thirds of accidental burns occur at work and the remainder at home. Alkali burns are twice as common as acid burns. And that's because alkalis are more widely used at home and um, in industry and how severe the burn is or the chemical inju injury is is related to the properties of the chemical that injured the eye and the area of the affected ocular surface how long um, it's been exposed to the chemical and so on 
Here are some comparison charts of um, different substances that are either acidic or alkali. Let's have a look at the acidic ones first. So things that can get in your eye include sulfuric acid or sulfurous acid. And these are found in car batteries or bleach and refrigerant. Hydrofluoric acid is found in glass polishing and mineral refining. Acetic acid is found in simple household vinegar and hydrochloric acid is found in swimming pools. So these are all things that could potentially get in your eye that could be found around your home. Then the alkali substances include ammonia. Ammonia is found in cleaning agents and fertilizers and refrigerants. Um, potassium hydrochloride is found in caustic potash. I think people use that for cleaning. Lye is found in drain cleaners and also airbags. Magnesium hydroxide is found in fireworks um, and flares. And lime is found in plaster, mortar, cement and whitewash. So again, it all comes down to careful history taking of what the patient was doing at the time of the injury. As I mentioned before, alkali burns are more dangerous than acid burns because you actually um, have these items very commonly found around the house. And they're lipophilic, and that means that they penetrate more rapidly than acid. And they also saponify, and that's like, you know, they become so soapy. So the fatty acids of the cell membranes um, allow them to, pen to penetrate, and they destroy collagen bundles in the corneal stroma. So damaged tissue secretes what's called proteolic uh, enzymes and this breaks down long chain molecules of proteins into shorter components and they cause further damage. So basically it's a it's a constant breaking down of the cells at the corneal level. If the anterior chamber is penetrated by a chemical burn, it can cause damage to the trabe trabecular meshwork and this then leads to an increase in intraocular pressure. Prostaglandins, which are found in the in the eye, are inflammatory media, uh, mediators, and they increase as a result of the damage to the anterior chamber, and they cause a further increase in intraocular pressure, and it becomes quite dangerous at that point. Acid burns um, will denature tissue proteins, and Coagulated proteins act as a barrier uh, and prevent further penetration. So this is quite different to alkali. Alkali tends to um, uh, really seep into the eye as opposed to acid, which, which does affect the eye, but um, it, it doesn't seep right down deep into the deeper structures. Here are some images of alkali burns, and you'll see on the top left image here, um, is a corneal haze, which has been caused by the um, substance. Fluorescein staining is the investigative technique used here, and the fluorescein has pulled at the area of the chemical burn. And down the bottom, we've got symblepharon formation, and this has occurred several weeks after a cement burn. Here's a picture of chemical burn caused by an acidic substance. And as you can see, the um, acid has a very, very severe impact on ocular tissues and the skin all around the eyes. So this is these are quite devastating injuries. These are usually caused by um, assault, I think, um, these acid burns. And as I said, very, very severe. Now a chemical burn is the only eye injury that requires emergency treatment without formal clinical assessment. And early irrigation is absolutely critical in limiting the duration of the chemical exposure. So the goal of irrigation or washing out the chemical is to remove the substance and restore the normal pH of the eye. So um, if the patient presents to emergency department the the patient will be treated in terms of their comfort level and they'll probably be given a topical anesthetic and then the irrigation will generally be started. 
this um this is these images show something called a Morgan lens and this is where is like this little cup that sits over the eye and then the irrigation solution can be washed through a little tube onto the eyelid and that this can um that this can be here on the eye for quite a while until all the chemical is removed from the eye and then the final topic in this presentation is trauma to the globe an orbital fracture results usually from trauma to the globe and it's also known as a blowout fracture and it's typically caused by a sudden increase in the orbital pressure from something that hits the eye that's actually larger than the opening of the orbital aperture. So things that commonly cause an orbital fracture include a fist, a tennis ball, uh, something like that so that the eyeball itself is, is um, displaced and transmits rather than absorbs the impact and so what you see is swelling and bleeding and also diplopia because there may be restricted extraocular muscle movement sometimes if the orbital floor has been damaged for example the extraocular muscles can fall in and get trapped and this causes the double vision and uh, the restricted muscle movement. In terms of the clinical investigation from an orthoptic point of view you need to list all the symptoms that your patient reports and question them, question them very very carefully about what has occurred um, and also propose a cause for the listed symptoms. So um, obviously the, the patient is going to require some uh, further investigation of eye muscle movement and so on if you're suspecting an orbital fracture. So here's the eye in question here, it's quite bruised and then an x-ray is showing that in fact there has been a fracture of the orbital floor here. So if you have a look on this eye, the orbital floor is intact, it's that little thin white line whereas here it's, it's broken down and fallen and so the extraocular muscles have also fallen through into the sinus cavity and the patient is going to have problems lifting their eye up. You can see they are actually looking up because the left eye is looking upwards but the right eye remains looking straight ahead and that's because they can't elevate their eye because these muscles down the bottom are trapped and not working. So that concludes this ocular trauma presentation. So to recap, we've talked about lid trauma, orbital trauma and orbital fractures, chemical burns and foreign bodies.